Hey, before I get started, I want to um, echo the thanks and the appreciation of everybody's uh, donations and help um, and with the, uh, the coat drive yesterday. Uh, I was told that they were, gave out around 42 coats uh, to, to, uh, to kids and even adults. Um, and uh, I got to hear a really great story from Charlotte was telling me about just some of the families and the way, you know, it not only blessed them to be able to come and get a coat, but also just kind of the, the love to show that there are people that care. Um, and there were even people that brought stuff to donate. So it's just kind of a cool reciprocal thing of giving back and forth and, and sharing together and helping each other. So um, really appreciate everybody being a part of that. So on February 4th of 2004 is when Facebook started. And actually at the time, it was called The Facebook. Originally, it was meant as a, um, a directory of students with their pictures and their basic info. And the idea was for Harvard students to use this as a way to meet other students and get to know them. Now, some people um, argue that this was just basically a, another way for guys to meet girls, um, and that may have been the case, but whatever the reason, um, it quickly caught on, and actually by September of 2006, anyone 13 years and older with an email address could have a Facebook account. Facebook now has grown to over 3 billion monthly active users. Uh, it's huge, um, and, and because of Facebook, many other uh, different social media platforms spawned and came from that. Different ideas came from it. Um, and, and truthfully, like anything else, Facebook, while it has its great sides, it also has its dark sides. It has its kind of negative things with it. But one of the things that I love about Facebook, one of the things that has kind of kept me there, and even amongst all the negative uh, things that, that do happen on there, one of the things that's kept me a part of Facebook um, are the memories that are there. It's kind of become a time capsule for, for me memories. And in fact, back in 2018, they introduced a new feature called Memories. And if you're a part of Facebook, if you're on there, you know that every day you get a notification of past memories, and it brings up pictures and posts, and maybe you put a recipe on Facebook, but it's all on that day for however long you've been on Facebook, it pops up those memories. And I, and I love looking at those memories, especially um, with having kids. Sometimes I hate it because it reminds me that, you know, time is, is a thief, um, and is stealing away uh, my children. Uh, but, but then there's also things that sometimes I look forward to certain memories. I'll get around certain times of the year, and I know that a certain picture or a certain post is coming up. And I'm like, oh, I know it's around this time. Usually I wonder when it's going to be. And then there it, it is. Memories are a powerful thing. They, they not only help us celebrate the past, but sometimes memories can even serve as a warning and, a, and kind of a bit of protection for us. You know, maybe there is a memory that you have that is not so great. Uh, maybe something that you'd kind of in some ways even like to for, forget. And, and not that we need to like zero in on or, or kind of like stay focused in on bad memories or painful memories, but sometimes there's really something powerful about having those negative memories even in, in the back of our minds serving as rep important reminders of those things. You see, memories are so important for us. I mean, that's the reason that we have our kids do things like memorize multiplication tables and study different facts and learn different uh, bits of history so that we don't repeat these things. Memories are an important thing. Well, today, as we kind of move into our second week of this series, uh, Wolves, where we're studying the book of Jude, uh, we're going to be looking at this idea of remembering certain things. We've been studying this book of Jude that's written by the half-brother of Jesus, um, and, and you'll remember that, that, he, that he's talking uh, to kind of Christians in general. Sometimes the books of the Bible uh, that are letters are written to a church. Sometimes they're written to one person, but this one is kind of written to ch Christians in general in the first century, but then beyond that to even us. And today, we're going to see the importance of us remembering the truth. And specifically, we're going to see uh, remembering that there are certain potential dangers that can happen in our lives when, when people begin to twist or distort the truth. Now, real quick, before we jump into our main text, and if you want to turn your Bibles to Jude, you can. We'll also have our text up on the screen in a little bit for you to follow along there. But I want you to remember something. Jude was warning um, about false teachers. He was warning about these 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 men these that were slipping in kind of as wolves in sheep's clothing, and they, they were there for their own personal gain. And while it's important that we kind of are aware of those types of people that can kind of weasel their way in and look to try and pose a threat to God's church um, and pose a threat to Christians, 
we're going to see today that Jude is going to take a little bit of a turn. And, and sometimes it's easy for us to rush past these things and kind of think that the author is writing about someone else. But I really think today the point of what Jude is saying is to these Christians and to us Christians. And, and the focus is going to kind of turn not so much on those people, but also on us. And so we see right away in our first passage in Jude chapter 5, or in Jude verse 5, I should say, it says, though you already know this, all of this, I want to remind you. And so again, real quick, before we kind of really dig into the whole passage, Jude, last week we saw he kind of started talking about others and the dangers of these, these apostates that, that we kind of hear, we heard this word, we learned this word last week that we never really use, but it's the idea of a person who takes the truth and twists truth and distorts truth for their own purposes. It's not when someone gets something wrong or misinterprets something, it's when they take truth and they twist it around. And so he goes from talking about someone else or other people, and he's now going to turn to his re readers and through them to us, and he tells them that he wants them to be reminded of something. And he even acknowledges that, like, hey, listen, what I'm about to talk to you about, you already know these things, but it's important for us to remember. And the things that he is going to remind these first century Christians about and subsequently remind us about, you know, they aren't they aren't going to be the greatest and the nicest and the happiest kinds of things. But Jude is going to kind of, for them, unearth some, maybe some bad memories, some things in their past and their religious and cultural past that they need to be reminded about. You see, and I think the reason he's doing that is that, is that it, it is, it's important to remember. It is an important thing for us to remember certain things, to be reminded even of the negative and even of the bad things sometimes in our lives that we want to kind of push away. Sometimes it's important to remember those things. I can remember when I was younger, much younger, I was probably about 12 years old. Um, I, I have a vivid memory that is still kind of lodged there in my brain that I think is going to probably be there for the rest of my life. I, I was on a church camping trip and there was a, a group of guys, there was probably about four or five of us that we decided to go off and do a little hiking off to the side nearby the campsite, but we went off by ourselves and I was the youngest. I was probably, you know, in sixth grade or so. So I was the youngest. The rest of them were in high school and I was doing my best to keep up with them. And they, we came to this large boulder, this large rock, they slid down. So I was like, oh, I'm going to do that too. So I slid down. But the bad thing was when they slid down, they had disturbed a, a yellow jacket's nest. And then I was the last one down. So yeah, you can guess what happens. I took the brunt of it all and they were all over me and I'll never forget that. And, and all that went on with, with, with that and, and the pain. But, but the thing is, is that that memory has stuck with me. And so now, now, whenever I go places like in the woods or if I'm going a couple weeks ago, we went hiking as a family and you see certain things and it kind of like sparks that memory and it pops up and you remember those things. And in many ways, it's a good thing because it reminds me of, of, a, of a bad thing I need to be careful of and also a bad thing that I can warn my kids. Hey, watch out for this kind of stuff because sometimes, you know, this can happen. You see, it's important when we remember these things because it provides warnings for what's ahead. So as we jump back in to our, our text, I want to give one more kind of like aside and, and kind of one more comment before we read it. The situations that Jude is going to talk about in these next several verses, some of these, you may read this and you may be like, what? what Jude, what are you talking about? For us, they may not seem familiar, but for these first century Christians, they understand, they understand a lot more of these situations and these scenarios. And so what can happen sometimes is when we see unfamiliar stories, sometimes we can get bogged down in wondering the, the details and wanting to know more about those things, and we miss the real point of those stories. And so let's not get caught up in the specifics of what we do and don't know about these stories, but let's get the lesson and the real meaning of why Jude mentions these things. So here we go. Jump into verse 5 again. He says, though you already know all these things, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with an everlasting chains for judgment day, or for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and all the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. So as we pause here, again, we, we, we're, we remember that Jude is writing to a, 
originally a Jewish audience, now a Christian audience. And these events, these stories that he is mentioning to them, for a lot of them, they know what he's talking about when they hear these things. And maybe some of them you recognize, but in this passage right here, or this section, he actually mentions three different stories. The first one was the nation of Israel. And he talks about how God's people were freed from slavery, how God went in, uh, sent his messengers in. They, he then delivered his people from, from slavery, from Pharaoh's uh, slavery. And, and then when they're in the wilderness, though, that God is ready for them to go into the promised land, all of them say, no, I don't think it's ready yet, except for two of them, Joshua and Caleb. They were the only ones that trusted in God. And because of their unfaithfulness, and because they didn't trust God, God allowed an entire generation of people to die and never see the promised land, all because they didn't trust in God. Or, or the second example that Jude talks about here, he talks about these, these angels who abandon their place. And, and there's different interpretations and different kind of ideas of what specifically he might be talking about here. But that's not really the point. The point is the fact that even angels, even angels could suffer punishment when they abandon God's truth. And then we see Sodom and Gomorrah. It's another uh, kind of name that you've read the Bible. You know much about the Bible. You probably recognize those names, whether you're, you're familiar with them or not. And we see in Genesis 19 that God uh, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and here Jude co comments about the fact that the people of these cities, they gave up God's truth, God's plan for relationships and sexuality. And because of that, because they gave up on that, because they gave up on God's truth, they were destroyed. And the reason that Jude brings these scenarios up and the reason that he wants them and he wants us to remember these things that happened in the past is that God will judge those who reject his truth. And these things are meant to serve as a warning to even us. He says no one's exempt, not God's own people, Israel, the one that he went to great lengths to free from slavery. I mean, you remember how it happened. He goes in there or Moses goes in there and they, it, God brings all these plagues and he does all these things. And then once they're free, they, God splits the Red Sea. And then, out, and then while they're wandering through the desert, God provides food in all these miraculous ways. But when they refuse to trust in God, when they refuse to follow God's truth, well, he wasn't willing to take them into the promised land. Or the angels that were mentioned. Again, it's not about the specifics of the story. It's about the fact that even angels, even those who are there in the presence of God, when they turn their backs on God, they suffer the consequences. And then that third example there of Sodom and Gomorrah, when they turn their backs on God's truth, God's standards, the way that God has called us to live, uh, we see that we suffer those consequences. When we use, like we saw last week, when we use God's word to try and be like a, a license for sin and a license for just living life however we want, we suffer those consequences. And the reason that we suffer from these consequences is that because when we reject God's truth, we are actually rejecting God. Jesus even said in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. You see, the same warning stands for all of us today. If we reject or if we uh, turn our backs on God's truth, well, then we're going to suffer the consequences, and so we need to remember God's truth and hold to it. Let's keep on going in our passage now in, in Jude 8. It says, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their bodies, reject authority, heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander what, whatever they do not understand, and the very things that they do not understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Now, this is another one of those spots that when you read this, even if you're like a seasoned Christian, even if you've been at this for a while, you read this passage here and you're like, wait, what? What's happening here with Moses and the archangel Michael? And you, I mean, you look at that and you think, okay, I, I think I kind of know of who Michael is. Sure, I got that. I mean, then, the, then there's the devil. And I know who that is. And then you hear the body of Moses and you're like, well, I know who Moses is, but what's this event of Michael and the devil and they're arguing and, and, and you, you, know, you kind of get to this and you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? And again, let's not miss the point of, what, of why Jude mentions this here. Because just as a moment ago, we read about these angels falling. It's about catching the meaning and the purpose of this. This time, Jude is referring to an event that we don't know a whole lot about in 21st century uh, America as Christians. 
But these Jewish uh, Christians, these Jewish uh, men and women, these readers, because of Jewish tradition and writings, they knew what this was about. That it was written long ago in their ancient books that were probably passed along and maybe even passed along orally. But we don't have those in the collections of books now that we call the Bible. But again, the point is not so much the, the story itself, it's the lesson. Um, the point was here was not over truly about the argument of a body. The point was not about uh, who gets the body of Moses. The real point of this was that the, was what Michael said. Did you catch it? It was in verse 9. When Michael said to the devil, the Lord rebuke you. Because remember what Jude's trying to do. He's trying to convince us of the importance of not falling into the same trap as these false teachers, these false prophets that were there, these wolves that were in sheep, sheep's clothing. And one of the big traps that they were falling into that he's trying to warn us about is that power can go to our heads. Power can go to our heads. Because Michael, the, the archangel that he's referred to sometimes, and Michael was only referred to a few times in the Bible, really only two other times besides here in Jude, once in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, where it said that he will eventually one day show up and will deliver God's people um, into their salvation. And then he's also mentioned in the book of Revelation, where he seems to be like leading the armies of God's um, angels. And so a Jewish audience, they would understand the weight of this idea of Michael coming into this situation. And, and you would maybe assume that someone that powerful with that much authority would just stand up to the devil and be like, no, you can't do this. And on their own authority. But that's not what he does here. No, Michael doesn't call on his own authority, doesn't call on his own power, but he calls on the authority of God. He doesn't rely on himself. He relies on God. But sadly, there are many today that that's what they want to do. They want to make it about themselves. They want to make it about their own authority, their own knowledge of, their, of the scriptures. Perhaps they, they know something about the Bible that someone else doesn't know, or perhaps they've studied the Bible in a certain way that maybe you haven't studied, and they want to kind of puff themselves up or display for people their knowledge, or even maybe their authority that they feel they have, or even a role that they may have. And it's all about that position and that power and that authority. But it's all about, it's, it's really not about that at all. You see, so often we, we get this mixed up and we forget that really in the, in the economy of, of Jesus's kingdom, that things are turned on their heads all the time. Sometimes we think it's all about how much strength or how much authority or how much power or how much knowledge we have. And Jesus says, that's not it at all. In fact, many of those who like to try and flex their religious uh, wisdom and their religious power and their religious authority, those were the ones that Jesus came down on so hard. We even see in Matthew uh, chapter 23 that Jesus, Jesus issues out seven different condemning statements to these religious leaders, these Pharisees. He says one of them in, in uh, verse 15, he says, "'Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are.'" You see, when we make it all about us. When we make it all about how much we know or how good we are or how high and mighty we might think that we are, man, we stand in the same danger that these people were standing in that Jude's trying to call attention to, that it's not about us. It's not about a title. It's not about a position or a role. It's about calling on God's power and trusting in him and his truth. Well, let's keep on going down in verse 11. Jude has a woe of his own. He says, woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now, again, we see that Jude's bringing up some more illustrations and some more, uh, some more uh, stories here. He brings up three different ones again, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Cain, if you remember all the way very back at the beginning of the Bible, Cain wanted to earn a relationship with God through his works. He thought if he could do things and he could somehow earn a relationship. Balaam, his error was to, was to, was to compromise with God's enemies and teaching the Israelites that they could just sin with immunity and not, any, not have to worry about anything. And Korah's rebellion, well, that was against God and his appointed lead leaders, Moses and Aaron. And all of these, these people, they stand as reminders that we can't, we can't earn favor with God through our good deeds and have an evil heart, and we can't compromise spiritual truths uh, to gain God's favor in our lives, and we can't turn our back on God's appointed leaders. And we, so he follows it up with this in verse 12 now. He says, these people 
our blemishes at your love feast, eating with you or eating eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars from whom uh, for whom blackness, blackness blackest darkness has been reserved forever. This last section here, what Jude is doing is he is he's taking these illustrations and he's trying to use these images, these shepherds who only feed themselves, these clouds without rain, these trees without fruit, these waves of the sea and the stars that are meant for darkness. He's saying these things, man, they should serve as obvious examples to you, but it seems like you're missing them all. Clouds that are full of rain. I mean, it, it, you, you see these clouds out there and they're full of rain. Like right now, man, we could use some rain. It seems like everything is so dry, but it's giving us nothing. Or these shepherds that are neglecting their responsibilities to feed the sheep and the, the sheep are dying, but the shepherds seem to be fine. Or the trees that never produce fruit. They look nice and pretty, but they're not doing what they're intended to do. Or the waves that just never seem to calm down, but constantly come in harder and harder. Or even the stars that never seem to ever produce any light and get lost in the darkness. You see, you see, these things are not as they should be. And Jude's point is that we should notice when there are these kinds of people coming into our midst who are doing things that are so obviously not what God has called us to, God, God has called us to with his truth and his word. But so often, so often we look past those things. And we want to build people up because of their popularity or their position. But the thing is that Jude's trying to help us understand is that it's easy to be blinded by sin. And, and I'm not talking about how the truth is that it's easy to be blinded by our own sin or miss our own struggles and the things that we're going through. I mean, sometimes we miss the sin in other people's lives. Sometimes we miss the sin that's in, within people's hearts in, our, in the lives that we should notice and we shouldn't be following after. Maybe it's a, it's a lack of perspective on our part that keeps us from noticing those who are leading us down the wrong kind of paths. You know, depending on our own personal experiences, our own backgrounds, maybe we don't recognize the things that are happening in those people's lives, and we have these blind spots, and they're only making the situations worse. In other kind of situations, sometimes we have a wrong interpretation of Scripture, and sometimes we understand God's Word in the wrong way, and we hear someone else who kind of shares that wrong interpretation as well, and we jump on board with them, and we, we feel like, yeah, well, I guess we agree with them in this. We might agree in other things. Or maybe it's even willful ignorance. And we find a person, and the persona is so great, and we like them so much, and we want to build them up, and we deliberately choose to ignore the wrongdoings because maybe it's inconvenient or it's uncomfortable or maybe it'll hurt someone's feelings or disappoint someone, and we don't want to make anybody upset. But friends, when we see these wolves in sheep's clothing, we need to stand for God's truth. And Jude tells us that the only way we're going to be able to do that is to remember the examples from the past. Maybe it's the examples from God's word in the past. Maybe it's the examples in our own lives of when we've chosen to follow our own path and walk down our own way and not follow after God and the troubles and the hardships that we've suffered because of that. But he says we need to remember these truths. So how do we do that? How do we remember the truth? Well, I want to give us two things that we can consider here, two things that we can be doing to be remembering the truth. The first one is that we need to repeat the truth. We need to repeat the truth. It's not enough for us to hear or read or experience God's truth just one time. You know, I, don't, I don't know about you. I don't know if you're a reader or not. Um, I, I'm the type of person that, man, when I've finished a book, like that's an accomplishment. I'll usually get like most of the way through it and I'll get distracted or just not give up on it. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, when you finish a book finally, Usually you kind of put it on the shelf and it's like, oh yeah, I read that. It's good. Maybe, maybe you're a, a reader that loves to go back to books and stuff like that. But, but God's word is not the kind of book that when you get to the end of it or you've read it a few times, well, I'm good. I've read enough of it. No, we need to be repeating God's truth. So it's really embedding into our minds and our hearts over and over again. In Second Peter, Peter writes this and says, he says, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. 
I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. We need to be repeating God's truth over and over and experiencing it and reading it and studying it over and over again. And that's why, that's why we have a church service every Sunday, because it's not a thing of like, well, you did it once and you're kind of good forever. No, we want to be able to come together over and over again and celebrate God's goodness and get into God's word together and be able to fellowship with God's people over and over again. That's why we study the Bible every time we get together and we make it such a big deal because we want to over and over again repeat it. It's the reason that we have communion every Sunday because we want to celebrate God's goodness to us and his grace and his mercy to us. We want to, we want to continue to repeat God's truth over and over and over again. Because well, we can be forgetful people. We can be people that, you know, we enjoy God's goodness and we can celebrate God's uh, truth and we can do these things one time. And if we're not careful, man, if we don't repeat it over and over again, next thing we know, we kind of look back over our shoulder and we think, well, how did I get here? I didn't realize that I was heading down this path and it's too late. Over and over and over again, we need to repeat God's truth. That means on your own, reading God's word. That means when you are here coming to these places to be able to gather to study God's word. That means in your life, living out God's word over and over and over again. We've got to be repeating the truth. But not only that, the other thing that I want to encourage you to do is to teach the truth. To teach the truth. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to like make everybody line up to take your turn on like a Sunday morning to preach a sermon, okay? Don't worry. I, I, you don't have to start sweating about that. I saw Allie start to break into a cold sweat over there. Um, you, you're not, we're not going to do that. But teaching the truth and sharing the truth and informing people, and whether it be within personal circles of your family and teaching your children, teaching your family God's truth, maybe it's teaching the truth to people in your life through your actions and the way that you live. But I believe that the more that we are intentionally trying to teach God's truth, a couple things happen. For one, God's truth is being taught. I mean, that's kind of an obvious thing, and that's a good thing. We need to be teaching the good news to people and telling people about God, telling people about Jesus and what he's done for us and how he's changed our life and how he's freed us, how he's made us brand new and how he can do the same thing for them. And so when we teach God's truth in those ways and we, we inform people about these good things that God's doing in our life, man, we are just we're teaching God's truth. And that's a good thing to spread God's truth. But not only that, when you, the more you teach God's truth, I find the more that it reinforces it in your own heart and mind. I mean, truly, that's one of the things that I love about being able to preach uh, so much is that it gives me an opportunity to get into God's word and to study. I've talked with some of our life group leaders and they've said the same thing about, man, you know, I really enjoy being able to lead this because it gives me a chance. Uh, it kind of forces me even sometimes to get into God's word and to study. And it's not that we think, well, I got to study so I know all the answers. So if anybody asks a question, I can know it all. But it's just one of those things that it, it helps us and gives us a regular opportunity to be studying and getting into God's word. Teaching God's truth is an important practice. That's why, that's why when the Apostle Paul was trying to encourage for possibly one last time his young apprentice, Timothy. He said this in 2 Timothy 2. In verse 2, he says, All these things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. You see, you and I, we need to take God's truth. The things that we have learned, we need to pass them on to others, but, but not only just pass them on to others, but we pass them on to others in a way that they can then pass it on to someone else who can then pass it on to someone else and down the line. We need to be repeating God's truth. We need to be teaching God's truth so that we can be remembering God's truth and what he's called us to. You see, remembering things is so important. And I'm sure you probably in your life, you've, you've gone to great lengths to build memories, maybe with your your spouse or your family. Maybe you've gone to great lengths to build memories with your friends. Maybe certain things that are just really important to you. Maybe you've had those pictures taken or those keepsake items that help remind you of important things. Man, it's so, it's so important that we remember things. It's so important that we keep those things in our minds. But it's also important that we at least keep part of those 
negative things in our minds. And again, I'm not calling us to dwell on or to focus in on the negative things of our past, the problems and the issues that God freed us from, saved us from. But I think it's important that we at least keep an idea in our minds to reinforce the lessons that we learned and to help us once again, when we come across those situations, when we come across those yellow jacket nests of life, and we don't slide down that, that rock anymore, and we can warn others and we can tell others, hey, look out for these things so that we can repeat that truth and so we can teach that truth to other people. Friends, let's remember the things that God's teaching us in our life, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, so we can take those truths and we can spread them out to others and we can guide others. Father, we come to you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that, we thank you that even though sometimes the truths that we have to learn are painful, sometimes the truths that we, we learn in life, man, we would love to forget those experiences. And, and maybe we can, God. Maybe you can help us put those pains and those struggles in our past. But God, you can give us, uh, you can give us the memory of the lesson we learned for them so we can pass them on to others. Lord, sometimes we learn the hard way. Sometimes we take the long route in life. And I think about the different folks even with just in this room and how I know some of the stories. I don't know all the stories, but I know some of the paths that we've taken. Some of those paths have been long, difficult paths. Other paths have been a path directly to you. Whatever path it might be, God, would you help each one of us this morning, today, to remember where you've brought us from, remember what you've saved us to, and to bring that and share that with others, Lord. God, I pray that as we learn from this book of Jude, and as we do our best to hold on to your truth, God, help us to be careful. Help us to be careful that we don't ever run ahead of you, that we don't make it about us, we don't make it about me, we don't make it about the person next to me. We make it about you. We make it about your truth. God, help us to hold on to that, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're going to finish this morning by one last song. Why don't we stand and sing this to the Lord?